Welcome to the Ask the Expert, featuring leading neurologist and muscle physiologist, Dr. Stephen Cannon, answering some of the most often asked questions from our website and social media channels. Remember, the content in this video is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions regarding a specific medical condition. And now, part two of Dr. Cannon's explanation of the genetic testing process and why it is so very valuable. In part one, we discovered how he and his team modifies DNA in mice to mimic muscle excitability in PP patients. The link to part one is in the description below. We highly recommend viewing that episode as well if you are interested in Dr. Cannon's research. Now for part two. After manipulating the DNA, we actually uh, confirmed that we made what we thought by sequencing it. And we get the results back as literally a series of single letters. So here's a G, 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 T, which is interpreted by the, the heights of these peaks. They run a reaction that's labeled with dyes. And again, it's making pieces of DNA of different size. Uh, so Dr. Wu um, has been working on gene therapy and manipulating the DNA inside a mouse muscle cell. And then we use this sequencing as a way to see whether we actually achieved uh, the editing that we were trying to make. Although this is tedious at times, the uh, benefit is that once you've gone through this process, once you understand that this particular variation uh, impacts the function of the channel and is likely to be responsible for disease, then you're done with that uh, particular variant. And you can add that to your catalog of distinguishing which variations uh, in the genetic code create susceptibility to periodic paralysis and which are just innocuous or benign changes. So that's a big part of what we do. The ion channels are just one piece of a big orchestrated set of uh, components that come together that enable muscle to be electrically excitable. So we need to test uh, just because this mutation changes the channel function, is this sufficient to really alter the excitability of the fiber? Does it predict that you're going to have loss of excitability and paralysis? Or is the change in channel function going to cause abnormally enhanced excitability of the fiber such that you'd expect myotonic stiffness? So we can begin to answer these questions with the computer simulations and make predictions whether things like changes in temperature or potassium levels might be a problem for this particular mutation. So it's a very exquisite example of personalized medicine, which is sort of the rage of today, but taken one step further. Not just what particular mutation is in your family, but what's the consequence of that mutation on how your muscles are behaving so that we can try to provide you with the best information of how to minimize symptoms. So another major area of investigation is to test how well muscle functions in our mouse models of periodic paralysis. So we isolate the muscle from a mouse and put it in one of these temperature controlled organ baths, and then we can apply a small electrical shock and cause the muscle to contract. So we're looking at the effectiveness of contractility, that is the muscle force, um, in response to various provocative triggers that um, cause attacks in people with periodic paralysis. And what we're doing is figuring out how sensitive certain mutations are to these challenges. So this is how we can measure um, the sensitivity of mutant muscle to having an attack of periodic paralysis and try to intervene with medications or other maneuvers to minimize the loss of force that would happen in this experiment. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to support this type of work. There are very few laboratories in the entire world that are still focused on periodic paralysis. It's a rare disease, it's a small niche uh, area of research, but we're completely dedicated and committed to this area. We've been uh, the beneficiaries of support from uh, providers such as the National Institutes of Health, the Muscular Dystrophy Association for years, and now the Periodic Paralysis Association is joining in the fight and supporting our laboratory as well. We're fully committed to uh, take this to the next stage to really bring uh, advances to the clinic to help our individuals, uh, to help patients, but we need your assistance to make this happen. Uh, money's tight everywhere. Um, the competition is fierce uh, to maintain support of our laboratory. A fair chunk of my time is actually dedicated to fundraising, writing applications, trying to get the resources to take it to the next level. 
We have very talented, uh, energetic uh, research staff and students who want to join our laboratory. The interest is there, the passion is there, but we need the resources to be able to take this um, to the next level. This area we use to grow cells in tissue culture. Here, Dr. Wu is preparing the culture dishes for growing these fibroblasts for testing the behavior of mutant channels. Once she plates them and, and uh, makes sure they're okay by looking under the microscope, we place them in a special environmentally controlled incubator that regulates the temperature, the amount of CO2 and humidity uh, so that they will remain healthy and uh, use the DNA as a set of instructions to actually make an ion channel have it expressed in the membrane, and then we can record the electrical currents as the next step. It's important that everybody realizes the funding for this type of research does not come from the university where I work. It does not come to the state that's supporting the University of California system. Research in academic medical centers is supported by grants that individual scientists compete for by sending applications to the National Institutes of Health. This is all meritorious work, only about 10% of highly meritorious proposals are able to be funded by the National Institutes of Health. So here on the monitor, you're seeing a picture of mouse muscle cells growing in culture. Each one of these long spindly objects is a muscle fiber. And this large one here in the middle, you'll see that rhythmic movement, it's a spontaneous contraction of mouse muscle growing in culture. With this apparatus, we're able to put the cultured fibroblasts on the microscope stage and use this fine manipulator to poke a cell with a small glass electrode and record the electrical currents. And here's an example of the currents recorded from the sodium channel that actually has the mutation. This is a continued battle for us to uh, raise money, to have additional resources to do this work. In addition to the federal government, there are advocacy groups like the Muscular Dystrophy Association, the Periodic Paralysis Association, and individual donors and gifts that come to the laboratory. This is absolutely essential uh, for us to hire our staff, maintain uh, care of the animals, to purchase equipment and chemicals. And so uh, your support is really essential in order for this work to continue. Go to periodicparalysis.org backslash donate there, you can donate directly to the crucial research needed to find better treatments and cure for this confusing and mysterious disorder. We also would like to thank our partners, Strongbridge Puma Tenacious Advocates, by providing breakthrough medicines and establishing unique methods of treatment for people with periodic paralysis. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.